Hello and good evening everyone. My name is Varun Pathak. I am the Research Secretary of the Student Council of BJGMC and the Head of Jignasa. Today I welcome you all to our event called the ICMR STS Experience. So as all of us know, ICMR has reintroduced its ICMR STS program this year. Uh, it has been a very prestigious program offered by ICMR for MBBS students throughout the years. But last year they had to take a gap because of the delays due to the COVID pandemic. So, but this year they have reintroduced it and I'm sure all of you are very excited to apply for it and write the proposal and get the stipend. But sometimes the whole process of, you know, writing the proposal, writing the report and actually doing the research can get a bit daunting. So that is why we've organized this event with our esteemed speakers to, you know, make the little, make the process a little easier and more exciting for all of you. So now I would just like to introduce all our speakers and tell all of you the flow of the event. Firstly, we have Dr. Aarti Kinikar, ma'am, the professor and HOD of the Pediatrics Department of PJGMC and Sasur General Hospitals. Ma'am is an excellent researcher who has more than 100 publications in well-renowned journals. She has done collaborative research in several, with, uh, in association with several different universities, most notably the Johns Hopkins University. And she is truly one of the finest researchers of Sasun General Hospitals. Uh, next, our keynote speaker is Dr. Vasudha Bhairavkar, ma'am. She is the uh, associate professor of the dermatology department of Sasun General Hospital, Pune. Uh, ma'am is an excellent academician, researcher, and a clinician. She has more than 60 uh, publications in national and international peer reviewed journals. She knows a lot about the different aspects of research methodology and I'm sure her knowledge will be a guiding light to us today. After that, we have a short session by three students from BJGMC who will tell us about their own experience and their journey in ICMR STS. Uh, all of these three students have received the ICMR STS, they've received the stipend and they've been through the whole process, right from the proposal writing to doing the research and the report writing. So I'm sure that their experience will teach us and, and help us make, uh, help us understand the whole thing. So these three students are Dr. Abnika Sane, who is an intern at the at BJGMC. Uh, we have Kasturi Dabale, who is a, a final year student at BJGMC, and Rudula Zoshi, who is a third minor student at BJGMC. So all of these three are excellent researchers, evidently because they've received their ICMR STS in the past years. So we'd like to welcome all of them and thank all of them for their time, for taking out the time to conduct this event and help out all budding researchers. So with that, I would like to hand it over to Arthi Kinikar, ma'am. Ma'am will be talking about uh, the entire process in general of ICMR STS and will also be giving some alternatives to ICMR STS because as you all know, ICMR STS is not the only way in which we can do research in our undergraduate years. Thank you so much. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, most of you may have gone to the ICMR website and also read about what this uh, student uh, short-term uh, scholarship is about. Now, before you embark on any uh, thought of doing a research work, uh, what I want to tell you is that it has to come from you rather than the mentor or the guide as to what you like and what you would like to do. So where do you begin? So if you go to the ICMR website, you will find that there is a long list of topics which the ICMR is interested in, the research topics. Just scan through all those things and see which topic is of your liking that is the first thing like unless you like a topic you cannot work on it you are having your guides and your mentors of course who will guide you the second part comes that uh, whatever topic you choose this is a short term uh, uh, sort of scholarship which you get uh, within a span of two to three months you have to collect the data, analyze it, prepare it, and then submit the uh, final project uh, to ICMR once you have got an initial uh, approval from them. So you have to make sure that whatever topic you want to do, you will be finishing in that short time. 
and the third part is is it feasible to do it in your own institute if you are in bj medical college choose a topic which you feel we are, our departments our hospital is well equipped to do it uh, you can uh, collaborate with other institute but then that is little bit time consuming because you have to work with those institutes uh, beforehand and also during the project and all these icmr projects you will have to do balancing your uh, routine activities which are academic activities your lectures your practicals you can get uh, away from those so it is something which you will have to plan so when you talk of research the first thing is that once you have chosen your topic you need to plan how you are going to conduct it along with your guide so i would suggest everybody to go on the sites and see what are the topics why am i telling you this that all students from all over the country are going to apply for these scholarships and they have to distribute the uh, acceptance of your proposals all across the states and they cannot concentrate only on one state or one college so your topic may sometimes be very good uh, and you feel you are going to get it but it is not approved by icmr but that shouldn't uh, sort of dishearten you and for that i'm going to just give you a few options where you can also try at these places uh, the same uh, proposal can be sent to these different places okay so the topic uh, like i'll give you an example where uh, icmr is interested now is something to do with say pediatric uh, nutrition malnutrition then you have various national programs the vaccines up uptake then you have a uh, tb programs uh, where you need to give inh prophylaxis is it being given then what are the problems a thalassemic person uh, has what are the problems faced by icu care uh, in a busy government hospital so you will have to think what is the treating clinicians in your own setup and that is why usually the icmr uh, projects are not to be taken by a first year first year you spend some time knowing the hospital you and what type of patients you get so when you enter the second year you will really see what the patients are what are their sufferings what are their problems and whether you can find a solution for them so this is one aspect and the other aspect is when you want to collect some demographic data which will help you to understand the burden of a disease okay and the third one of course is when you are doing some intervention which is really new and you want to see whether it works in the patient and helps them so those all those things we will be going into detail in subsequent sessions varun will arrange them for you uh, when you talk of uh, the first part the where to start it so once you have decided a topic once you know it is feasible and uh, then you with your guide you will try to find the first part which is what is what am i going to do in this next 2 3 months and that is what uh, dr vasudha madam is going to take to uh, in this session and already we have three of our students kasturi mrudula and avni who have gone through this process so the seniors are always there to guide you and that's why last year manali has formed this uh, jigyasa club it is basically for interactions you don't need us always you have to interact between yourself you have a problem you come to us and we are always available to you any time so let us see a few options suppose uh, you don't get through the proposal like once you have chosen it submitted if you get through you are lucky if you don't the proposal is not bad it's just that there are too many people and there is a priority which is given to something that is new and if it is not been done before then the chances are your acceptance rate is high but uh, you can apply to muhs 
there are student scholarships. If you go on the MUHS website, you will get them. So you have to uh, apply over there, submit your proposal, and even at the end of it, you give your project to them. There is a, a scholarship of 10,000 rupees and a, a certificate which comes from the university. So there is a process of selection over there, so that you need to go. The next one is if you are interested in tuberculosis, the National TB Elimination Program has got a, a operational research and a, for postgraduate thesis topics. So for thesis, when you become a postgraduate, you can get now it is 30,000 rupees, but the topic has to be TB related. And if you have a guide who is interested, you can always work with them and then you can get something like an operational research uh, award from the uh, National TV Control Program. Of course, the funds will come to the guide and you will learn how to do operational research. So why a program is working or not. So for that, you will collaborate with a guide uh, and uh, from the institute and you can be a part of that particular study. Besides this, ICMR has uh, other projects which under the mentorship of your guide, you become a co-investigator. And that is one option. This is non-STS. Uh, so you will always be working with somebody uh, and uh, being a part of a larger study which is done by a guide. And the next ones uh, which are there is there are many institutes, even DMER. They have got research projects where you send it to them uh, through the guide and you there used to be a star our project research project awards. Mm -hmm. So even our medical education does it. Then of course you have from other universities where you will have to collaborate with them. So basically collaborative works are there everywhere. And uh, once you go on the websites of how you collaborate with other institutes who are doing, so any medical college from the other state, if you want to collaborate, there are certain guidelines which are there. You follow them and you can be a part of the team. Now in BJ, we have a clinical trial unit which is there. And through it, Dr. Vasudha, Madam, myself, we both are Fogarty scholars of uh, John Hopkins University. And uh, we learned uh, many things by collaborations with them and they taught us how we should write grants. What is writing grant is also a part, like you may want to do something really new and novel, but the funds are required. So how to go about it? So mm -hmm. under the mentorship of your guide, you can learn how to ask for funds to carry on your research. What are your responsibilities? So with John Hopkins, we get many students coming from US to do small projects over here under our guidance. So similarly, you can do it with their help also. We can arrange for those. There's a lot of data which is available from last 20, 22 years have been associated. So many data on TB, HIV is available with us. Uh, you can analyze that data and publish it and be a part of that team. So those interested in data analysis who are good at computers, statistics can look into that part. Then uh, there is a link which I will be sharing with Varun uh, where Southeast Asian countries there are uh, frequently, every month almost, you will have some research grants which are there and there are all guidelines how you can apply for it. So uh, I'm a part of that uh, team TAFOD and TAHOD and you can apply for uh, becoming a scholar over there. We work with the Australian universities, the Thai universities, Chinese, Philippines. So once you enter into those, those are international collaborations. So step by step, you start from BJ, then you expand it, and then you can, with uh, people in uh, BJ, you can move forward at international levels. So I think I will stop here because it's a, a whole new topic uh, which we can discuss at some later date once you have your projects uh, going. 
so i think i will hand over to you varun and if there are any queries about uh, where to apply in case we can't get through the icmr you can come and meet us in the department we can individually guide you depending on the topic which you have chosen for your work so over to you varun and you can take it forward then thank you, thank you so much ma'am those were really a lot of alternatives that you know gave an insight into what all we can do if we really want to pursue research so now i think i would like to hand it over to dr vasudha ma'am uh who will be talking about how we can choose a research question come up with a topic and uh, in short talk about how to write a whole proposal so i'd like to hand it over to dr yeah. vasudha ma'am yeah sure uh, good evening everyone thank you arti ma'am for uh, that extremely uh what you can say wonderful introduction and setting the tone for this talk and uh, i just would like to share my screen and made a small presentation to make things a little clearer for us all without further ado so formulating a research question of course is the first step for any research so we ought to know what research question to select because as ma'am said if you are intending to do an icmr project there are obviously you know there are restrictions because the icmr is going to have or rather it's going to prioritize certain topics certain fields or certain research questions which as madam said are going to be available on the icmr website but i'm going to broadly tell you as to how to go about selecting a research question because there is life beyond icmr so it's not as if you need to only restrict yourself i saw someone post a question in the chat box that do we need to restrict ourselves to the list mentioned on the icmr website so the answer to that is actually yes and no yes if you want to have a you know you want to increase your chances of you know, getting selected then maybe yes but that's not the end all and be all of it all because they do look beyond those topics as well so i have we have all had students who selected topics beyond the ones mentioned on the icmr website and they really got selected and their topics have been approved but yes as ma'am says you try to you know increase or enhance your chances of selection if you choose one of the topics or choose one of the fields that the icmr has mentioned so let's go ahead with this what is a research question so it is basically the uncertainty about something so it's a question so we need to want to know something so we have to know what are the gaps in knowledge regarding a particular field so it's about something in the population that you as an investigator would want to resolve and you have to be able to resolve that by making measurements in the study population so one thing is there you see there are two terms here one the first sentence mentioned is population and you have study population so that just shows that there is a difference between the study population and the population in general so you have to select a research question or you have to select the way you are going to go about it you have to select the number of people that you are going to involve which will allow you to generalize your findings to the population at large so that's something that we are going to come to a little later on maybe not in today's uh, you know semi uh, webinar we are going to deal with it a little later on in the subsequent meetings so first and foremost so what is this uncertainty uncertainty is nothing but data needs so why do we need a clear research question now there has to be clarity in your mind the clarity has to be there because this clarity facilitates the choice of the most optimal study design now unless you know what you want to know you are not going to be able to know how to go about it so what is the study design the study design is nothing but the way or the plan that you are going to devise to go about finding the answer to your research question you also would like to know who to include in your study what outcome should be measured so what is the end point so what are you trying to find out and when the outcome needs to be measured that is what is the time frame that you are going to give yourself to find out the answer to your question so in case you do not have a clear research question there is going to be a lot of ambiguity regarding the study design the study population the sample size the outcome measures and the time frame or the duration of the study so that is the reason why we need a clear research question so now how do you translate this particular uncertainty into a research question so the first thing that you have to do is you have to frame the problem in specific terms so you may be having a lot of obviously we want to know about a lot of things that we don't know at your stage definitely you are going to have a lot of curiosity you are going to be intrigued about various things 
those of you who are in second year are exposed to your paraclinical subjects like microbiology, pathology, maybe forensic, pharmacology. Those of you who are in third year or who started with their clinical postings would want to know a lot about their topic of interest, maybe medicine, dermatology, pediatrics, OBGY, anything at all. But when you start with research, you should be able to put that problem on paper in very specific terms. And it should focus on one single issue. It should be written in everyday language. So the research question is written in simple language. But the next thing, that is the objectives which stem from the research question, they will be written in medical or scientific language. That I'm going to come to a little later on. And there are some things, you know, your verbs, etc. We've learned all this in English. But here, this is going to be very useful because there are different verbs that are going to be used for different types of research questions. So that verb is very important. So you should have, you can have more than one operational work if required. But most important thing is a research question by definition is going to be stated as a question with a question mark. We all know, we've all learned punctuation in uh, your English language in school, etc. And we know that a question always is followed by a question mark. So that is how a research question has to be denoted in your proposal. So there is a life cycle. So every research has got a life cycle. We all have a life cycle and so does research. So let's go through the life cycle. So first thing we need to do before formulating a research question is to identify the data needs, spell out the research question. Next, we need to formulate the study objectives. Next, we have to plan the analysis. And finally, we have to prepare the data collection instruments accordingly. So this is only half the battle one. Next part. Once you finalize the data collection tools, etc., you have to implement it. That part was just the planning part or the designing part. Now you move on to the how you are going to work out. So there is something which is called as the anatomy of research and something which is called as the physiology of research. So the previous slide that you saw was the anatomy of research, so the structure of research. Now what I'm going to tell you about is the physiology or rather how your research is going to work out. So what you're going to do is you're going to collect data, you're going to analyze it, draw conclusions. Based on these conclusions, we will formulate recommendations and then inform stakeholders. So who are these stakeholders? Stakeholders are nobody but people who are the community at interest. For example, ma'am mentioned a few areas, say in um, regarding tuberculosis. Now suppose you take up a research question which is related to the implementation of the INH or rather INH prophylaxis in child contacts of patients with tuberculosis. So here, who are the stakeholders? The stakeholders would be those who have created the program. The stakeholders would be the healthcare providers, the institution. The stakeholders would also include the patients and their families. So these are all the stakeholders, those who implement it and those who are involved or those who are going to be affected by them, by your findings in any way. So this is what you mean by stakeholders. So this is the life cycle of research, the anatomy in the previous slide, and this slide tells you about the physiology of research. So now what are the sources of your research question? First and foremost, you have to go through published literature. So once you think of a particular field or a particular branch that you want to do research in, for example, somebody wants to do research related to microbiology, maybe related to syphilis, for example. Okay, so you have to first read regarding syphilis. When you read regarding syphilis, you'll come to know that what are the gaps? There are some gaps in the knowledge or the information we have regarding this particular topic. So then you would like to fill that gap. So your research question would stem from this. Second way or sorry, the second source for a research question is you have to be alert to new ideas and techniques. So all of you are techno savvy. So you all know, you all Google. So you know exactly what the new techniques are. For example, again, going back to microbiology and syphilis, there are maybe some new, there is some new, you know, uh, tool, diagnostic tool that has come up for the diagnosis of a particular disease. It could be COVID, it could be any other disorder or any other disease. So this is how you have to find out that, yes, there is some, some gap or there is something missing. There is some deficiency in the diagnosis of a particular disease. And we are trying to fill that gap by doing this particular research. Okay, that is the second way to go about it. The third way or the most important thing for us is to keep the imagination roaming. 
Now, all of you are, uh, you know, some of you are in first year. As Ma'am said, first year is not really the best time of your uh, MBBS to do research because you are very raw, you know, you want to get exposed to different subjects. You don't know exactly where your interests lie. You do not know how to go about finding out a research question. So you're just learning, you're observing. So the end of your third year, probably, you can think of doing a research. So, but for the sake of those of you who are already in your first year, just to keep them interested in this particular webinar, maybe anatomy, maybe physiology or biochemistry, you might want to think something. When you go on to your second year, you can still go back to your first year subjects, select a mentor from your first year subjects and do or pick up a particular research question from that subject. Okay, so you have to keep your imagination roaming. You have to keep thinking of what you might want to do or might want to learn regarding a particular topic in anatomy for matter. You want to find out about the bone structure or you want, while doing the section, you feel that, yeah, there is something regarding age. You want to know how to identify a particular person's age based on the bones or something like that. Okay, so you have to keep imagining things. Those who have creativity, those who have imagination, they can definitely come up with really interesting research question. So the next step would be choosing a guide and mentor. I have kept a font for this big because this is an extremely important stage of your research question because a guide or mentor is somebody who is, you know, someone who's going to be holding your hand. They're going to lend you their shoulder to lean on their hand. So they're going to hold your hand and guide you throughout this particular research. So you have to choose your guide accordingly. But obviously, you have to select a guide or mentor based on the branch that you want to do your research in. That obviously depends on you entirely. Okay, there is no such hard and fast rule that you have to select a particular branch or a particular guide for doing research. So I think you have that flexibility. And most of you who are in your second and third year are familiar with all the faculty in BJ Medical College. And you definitely can approach anybody you want and all of us are there to help you out. Okay, so the next step. So what are the steps in conceiving the research question? So you have to review the available information. Based on this information, you raise a question. Then you decide whether this question is worth investigating and what are the aspects of these questions that are worth investigating by peer review. So what is this peer review? Peers are nobody but your own friends maybe. Peers could be your guides. Peer could be somebody in your guides, uh, colleagues. Okay, they are the peers for you. So you have to discuss this with them and find out whether this question is really worth investigating. Then what you do is you define the measurable exposures. So I'm going to come to this a little later. So what are the exposures and outcomes related to this particular research question? This is what you have to define. So this is an extremely important step. Next, what you do is you sharpen the initial question. So what this means is that the research question is like a triangle with the broad end at the top. So you begin broad and then you narrow it down to an apex. Okay, That is how you go about it. And then finally, you refine the question by specifying certain details. Okay, So this might sound a little abstract to you, but I'm going to give you a few examples based on which you'll be able to understand this better. So coming to the categories of research questions. Now the research questions are of two broad categories. One is the descriptive research question and the second is the analytical. Okay, so these are the two broad categories. Many of you who are already working on proposals for your ICMR, you must have found in your proposal, there is a section on methodology. In the methodology, you have to mention the study type. Okay, above the study type, they have asked regarding the study, uh, above the study design, they want you to mention the study type. So this is the study type. Either it's, it's a descriptive study or it is an analytical study. So. Let's have a few examples of both types of questions. So what are these descriptive questions? So these descriptive questions, they just involve observations to measure a quantity. Here you will not be having a comparison group and you will not be performing any intervention during your research. So this is what you mean by a descriptive question. It will only describe what you're observing and you will obviously be measuring a quantity without comparing or intervening. The next type of question is the analytical question. This involves comparisons. It might involve interventions. And what you would do here is you would test a hypothesis. So what is this hypothesis all about? So let's just take up a random research question. 
so this is should diabetics do exercise daily so this is an extremely vague and broad research question that we are going to begin with and let's see if we can sharpen it down the line so we have all seen the steps of a research question or how to conceive a research question so let us put this particular research question in the template that we have seen and see how we can refine it okay so the review of information so what you would like to do is you would like to find out regarding exercise and diabetes how exercise would affect a person with diabetes would it help reduce the body fat and blood sugar how it would improve the person's ability to protect himself or herself against certain diabetes related complications so this is how i want to read regarding literature see how this literature is going to help you you know decide regarding a focused research question based on based on this broad research question okay next what you would do is you would raise a question so the first question that would come to your mind is can exercise help control blood sugar level so this is one question that comes to mind regarding exercise and blood sugar so this is not a very focused research question because here you need to define what you mean by exercise and what you mean by a blood sugar level so this is a very vague question but it's okay for a beginner it's okay because we are going to sharpen this further then what you do is you decide what are the aspects worthy of investigating based on peer review so you would discuss this with your guide maybe you would discuss it with your friends your guide would discuss it with their colleagues etc here there are certain questions that come to mind so what is the level of reduction in blood sugar what are the optimal type frequency intensity and duration of exercise what are the risks involved of exercise in this particular patient and what are the other benefits that the patient might have by doing exercise so these are a few aspects of exercise and diabetes that you might want to study okay so then next you move on to the next step that is defining the measurable exposures and outcomes so in this particular research question exposure would be exercise so you have to define what you mean by exercise you have to define the duration of exercise the frequency of exercise and the outcome here is the fasting blood sugar level so what what do you want to achieve what is the blood sugar level that you want to achieve after doing this entire exercise thing okay so this is broadly what you mean by exposure and outcome now how do we go about sharpening the initial question so one thing that comes to mind is among diabetics does physical activity for 1 hour daily help in reducing fasting blood sugar level so you can see what we started it started was just exercise and diabetes now you are focusing it on the duration of exercise so 1 hour and the type of exercise physical activity the frequency would be daily and the outcome is reduction of the fasting blood sugar level so you can see here now you are making it sharper and more focused okay so now next step or the final step is to refine the question by specifying certain details so the study population so which is the patient population or the your target population in which you are going to perform this research what are the operational definitions of your the variables that you are going to take that is the exercise the fasting blood sugar so you have to define all this when you pick up a research question and finally you have to decide on the study design that you are going to pick up to answer your particular research question okay so this is one so now coming back to descriptive and analytical research questions for the same model a descriptive research question would be what is the extent of walking practiced by diabetics regularly okay so this does not measure or rather does not compare anything there is no intervention what you are trying to do here is you are just trying to find out the extent of walking that is practiced by certain diabetics that's all okay the same example while putting it in an analytic mode would be will brisk walking by diabetics for 1 hour daily reduce the fasting bsl as compared to those who do not walk okay so here you can see there is a comparison compared to those who do not so that means we are comparing this particular group of diabetics who are doing exercise with a group of diabetics who is not doing exercise and we are also there is an intervention that is walking briskly and we also have defined how long that the person is going to walk okay and the outcome also has been defined over here that is reduction in fasting bsl so you can see here this is the reason why we are calling this particular question as an analytic question okay so now 
what is this research hypothesis? So hypothesis is something which summarizes the main elements of the study. So here you would have a sample, sample population in which you are going to be performing the research, the exposures and outcomes. We also would require this research hypothesis to tell us which particular statistical tests we are going to be picking up to answer this question or to analyze the particular data that we are going to be compiling. Okay. And we require certain comparison groups okay, for analytical research questions. So all this is decided with the help of a hypothesis. But I'd like to tell you one thing that most of us get confused when we are asked regarding a hypothesis. So please remember that purely descriptive research questions do not require a hypothesis. Hypotheses are meant for analytical research questions and not for purely descriptive research questions. So don't need to rack your brains when you are picking up a descriptive research question. You do not need a hypothesis for this. So how do you decide looking at the question whether your research question is descriptive or analytic? So if you have terms like greater or less than, causes, leads to, compared with, more likely than, related, associated, similar to. So this means that you're comparing it with something. Okay. So these are all clues that the research question is, a, is an analytical type of research question and not a descriptive type of research question. So these are the terms that are going to be used in the research question of analytical study. Okay. So now we are done with the research question part. Now to make the research question more objective, we are going to be converting or translating that research question to objectives. We already saw that a research question has to be in everyday language. Okay, It is not meant to be in very scientific language as such. But when we translate the research question into objectives, we have to frame the same thing in scientific language. In a research question, you can use more than two verbs. We just saw that. Okay, But in an objective, you have to use only one verb. Okay. You can have many objectives instead of complicating one objective and you know everything mixing everything and putting it into one long objective you can sort it as a primary objective and a secondary objective here you have to be very clear about the type of research question that you are trying to formulate i've already mentioned this so this has to be clear in everybody's minds therefore i am repeating this so a descriptive one will be measuring a quantity while an analytical one will be testing a hypothesis and will be having some intervention and will also be having some comparison group. Okay. I hope this is clear to everyone. Okay. So now coming back to our research question regarding diabetics and walking. So can brisk walking by diabetics for at least one hour daily reduce fasting blood sugar level as compared to, do not, to those who do not walk? So this is our research question. So now the primary objective for this would be to determine the effect of brisk walking for at least one hour daily on the fasting blood sugar level of patients with type 2 diabetes as compared to those who do not. So you can see here that we have translated this into an objective. So we, this is a question while this does not have a question mark at the end of it. And here we have used the verb determine to determine the effect. Okay. So this is the primary objective. So looking at this particular verb, we should be able to answer or rather we should be able to make out whether this is a primary of uh, this is a primarily a descriptive research question or an analytical research question. Okay, so this is the clue to this particular thing. So coming back to descriptive versus analytic, if you are using a descriptive study design, the verb you need to be using is estimate. Okay, so you will be saying estimate the prevalence of physical activity. But if you are using the term or rather the verb determine, then it is an analytical research question which would be testing a hypothesis. So going back to the objective, the term or the verb used here is determine. We are using a comparison over here. Therefore, but obviously this particular study is going to be an analytical study. Okay. So now let's come to certain good and bad examples of study objectives. Determine the importance of sedentary lifestyle among diabetics. So uh, can someone just unmute yourself and tell me, is this a good or a bad example of a study objective? Somebody, Varun, we can, maybe we can begin with you. Hello. Why not?
yeah and importance okay importance is not exactly a very clear cut outcome measure okay we don't know what you mean by important it's a vague term so a better way to go about this would be to estimate the prevalence of physical activity among diabetics so this would be a descriptive research question where you are trying to find out what is the level or what is the amount or how much of physical activity is done by diabetics okay so this is a very specific thing you are trying to find out the prevalence so just importance so importance is not a good term to use because we, it doesn't convey what you are trying to find out okay now coming to the second one to assess the physical activity and diabetic complications anyone else what do you think this is is this a good or bad example of a study objective someone unless they've all left or fallen asleep no no they are there lavanya i can see you on the screen lavanya do you want to answer that ashwini okay. yes lavanya See, anyone you, anybody okay. or whoever wants to unmute research cannot be done without discussion okay I, otherwise it becomes just one way traffic no ideas yeah. are coming i mean i don't even know whether you all are awake and alive at the other end or not so please unmute yourself please switch on your camera and answer because we are here to just discuss this it's not going to be a one way thing someone if nobody then we have uh, ma'am i think um, instead of assess physical activity and diabetic complications we should use the word contraindications okay size for diabetic like what are the contraindications um if diabetic patients uh, do exercise okay so rather we can say that we would like to estimate the effects of physical activity on diabetic complications okay this is because we saw earlier that physical activity as i mentioned your this is important to know the literature regarding physical activity and diabetic complications whether physical activity causes diabetic complications or physical activity can avert diabetic complications so literature i showed you in the initial slide that in uh, literature mentions that it has a good effect physical activity can avert or delay certain diabetic complications okay so that, that's why we want to find out or rather we want to estimate the effect of physical activity on diabetic complications as you say maybe i mean if you're not sure literature has not told you this then yes you're right maybe it could have an adverse effect also it might induce diabetic complications also so unless and until we perform this study we might not be able to answer this question so we have to go to literature and get an idea as to what the answer to this question might be okay but for starters at your level you can just say that a better way to state or rather formulate an objective for this particular thing is to estimate the effect of physical activity on diabetic complications so this is again what do you think is this a descriptive question or is this an analytical question or rather a objective a descriptive question yeah right descriptive because here we are just trying to estimate the effect we are not trying to we are not comparing this group with anybody okay and we are not intervening in any way i mean we are just observing and we are just finding out the effect of physical activity on diabetic complications had it been to determine where then we will have to have a control group for this okay those who do physical diabetics doing physical activity compared to diabetics who do not do physical activity then we would think of it as an analytical research question and we would use the verb as determine and we would also like to compare the two groups okay so here we are just using a descriptive study design or the type of study here would be descriptive okay the next one is to evaluate depression and diabetes anybody how can we improve this question or this particular objective here can you think of any way in which we can improve this make it into a good example of a study objective uh, maybe uh, hmm. estimate uh, the prevalence of depression in people suffering from diabetes right 
yeah so evaluate is again very you know we have come across many undergrads or even post graduates who for their thesis write there to evaluate so and so and so and so what do you mean by evaluate what are you trying to do exactly because evaluation is an extremely ambiguous term so what we are trying to evaluate what are we trying to assess that has to be spelled out very clearly so here one way to go about it would be what you mentioned was a good research question of the descriptive type where you would like to estimate the prevalence of depression in amongst diabetics the analytical form of this same thing analytical version of the same thing would be to determine whether depression is more common among diabetics as compared to healthy individuals okay so the same thing can be converted into an analytical type of research question where we would use the term determine and more common that means we are comparing two groups one is the diabetic group and the second one is the control group that is the age and matched healthy individuals okay so i hope this is clear to you as to what are descriptive research questions and what are analytical research questions is it clear or would you do you want some more clarity or some more explanation regarding this because this is the beginning of your research form the formulation of your research question depends upon this okay what type of research you want to do okay if there are no more questions regarding this i'll just move ahead okay so asking yourself the right research question so poor or irrelevant research question is not going to take us Thank anywhere you, hello yeah. sorry to interrupt you ma'am i have one question right ma'am uh, how can we uh, take a subject like on or uh, some schemes like national health program has how can we take in an analytical question of that like uh, there are various uh, programs run by government mahatma gandhi jan arogya yojana and all that things uh mahatma gandhi jan arogya yojana but what are you trying to what are you trying uh, to determine over there what are you trying yeah. to find out so then how many ah uh, yes ma'am benefits like uh, benefits of patients such as uh, going under like uh, they are give uh, kidney operations and all that thing that perinephric abscess operation and all that stuff under uh, mahatma gandhi jan arogya yojana okay so maybe you would like to determine as to the benefits or rather how what are what are the advantages or what are the benefits of this particular program to patients who you know who are the beneficiaries versus those who are not beneficiaries what are the you know in what way they have benefited that that is one thing comparing the two groups those who are eligible for this particular janagi uh, whatever program you are talking about i'm not familiar with that program but there are some patients or so some individuals who would be eligible for accessing this particular program and there would be some who are not eligible for it so if you are trying to determine or if you want to find out the benefit that patients can get out of this then you can use a control group of patients who are not eligible for this or who are undergoing the same procedure or who are facing the same disease or suffering from the same disease but who are not availing of the benefits that the particular program is giving so that could be your control group and then you can find out the outcomes or rather compare the outcomes between the two groups that could be one way of going about this particular thing in an analytical way Ma'am, could you think of something else regarding this? Yeah, Sheetal, isn't it? Sheetal asked the question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you have the Mahatma Jyoti Ba Phule program. Now the beneficiaries for it are those who belong to below poverty line, and that is why yellow and orange ration card. Okay, so your uh, population whom you want to see. the beneficiaries are going to be this whole group now some of in our entire group say you wanted to do about say kidney transplant there is some amount of a package where the kidney transplant can be done so if there is a person who is a beneficiary by the category but doesn't have any documents okay to yes ma'am get enrolled into it so now you want to analyze that those people who are beneficiaries and who have all documents versus those people who do not have the documents both have got the same disease okay now the person who has benefits will 
come under it, get all the things done and get his kidney transplant within a matter of say six months. And the other person who is a beneficiary but doesn't have documents wants a kidney transplant and it, he has to wait for how long? Is it two years, three years? So now you are having these two scenarios. You will combine it and see what is the time required to undergo a renal transplant among patients who are beneficiaries of the MGPGY program but in two groups, those who have all documents and those who have no documents. Okay? So then okay. you will find out, well, how will it help? It will help to find out that they have no ration card, they belong to other state, or their names are not in the ration card, or they have a ration card in their uh, hometown where the benefits of the ration card are given to their old parents and they are in a city, they don't want to make another ration card. Some people will say that it is taking a lot of time to get a ration card, it has been stopped. So if when you do such a study, you will be, uh, this study will help the administration to overcome the problems which are there for the beneficiaries in the program. Okay, so it has got long term benefit. So what is the take home message that when you have any analysis, analytical study to be done, the study population has to be same. Okay, if I have a person who is not a beneficiary, then I cannot compare. So the beneficiary should be both in that program. Okay? Okay, ma'am. Understood? Is it clear? Otherwise, uh, sometime yes. later you can come and meet me. We will okay, explain it to you. Even Vasudha, we are all in COVID building. Come on the second to third floor. We will explain Thank it to you. you. Okay? Thank you, ma'am. Right. Yeah. Over to you, Vasudha. Okay, so, yeah, so what, how do you find out whether the research question that you have formulated is the right one or not? Okay, or is it irrelevant or is it poor? So you try to answer it. So if the answer is not of any use to anyone, obviously it's not a good research question. So for that you have to see whether what are the long term benefits. Like for example, going back to the question that we were just speaking about regarding the NJPGY program. So here... Obviously, the benefit that the patients are going to get out of this program is the stakeholders here would be the, those who are implementing the program as well as the patients who are going to be benefiting from the program as well as the government. Okay, so these are the stakeholders. So if you're trying to find out something that is going to help us implement this in a better way or help the patients get or access the program in a better way or rather they, whatever they are trying to get the money or uh, the procedure is going to be fast track or uh, anything like that, okay, then definitely it is going to be a useful research question. It is a correct research question. If you end up trying find, uh, or if you end up finding something which is not of use to anyone, okay, then of course you are not, because see, finally what is the end point of research? The end point of research is that you are going to be able to, you have to ideally try to publish it. Okay, because unless and until you publish it, you are not going to be able to disseminate this particular knowledge or your findings or your recommendations are not going to be uh, disseminated to anyone, nobody, neither the stakeholders nor the uh, people who are going to be benefiting from it. So that is the end point. So journals will only take your research or take your paper or manuscript if and only if your research question is focused and it is useful and it is relevant. So that is the first step in a particular research question, finding out if it is a relevant research question. Next thing is, if there is no answer at all, after you finish the whole thing, you do not find an answer to the research question, then of course it's useless. So this is, this tells you that it's not going to be of, it's not going to be prioritized neither by the ICMR, neither by your, uh, any other agency that you're going to be approaching for funds or grants or anything. Okay, so this indicates that you need to change or reframe your research question. Okay, so if the research question is wrong, so no amount of good work is going to be able to save you. So that is the beginning. So the maximum amount of time that you need to spend, almost an equal amount of time that you spend for conducting the research is going to be going into formulating the correct research question. And then of course that's like almost like half the battle one. 
Okay. So now, what do you mean by a good research question? So it should pass the so what test. Okay, there is something called as so what. So if someone says, okay, this is what I have asked. So what? I mean, so what's what's such a big deal about it? So it should be able to pass this so what test. So it should be feasible. So which means that there should be an adequate number of participants available to be able to answer that question. There should be technical expertise in your institute. We all know in BJ Medical College there are certain limitations because it's a government medical college. If you try to do something like electron microscopy or you try to do something like uh, direct immunofluorescence or even you know some things which are probably not available in our setting then there are going to be hurdles unless and until you collaborate with someone outside there may be expense involved or whatever so you might have to abort that particular research halfway through so what you need to find out first and foremost is whether your particular research question is feasible okay in terms of everything participants are you going to get enough number of patients to involve in your research do you have enough resources and the expertise okay next thing is interesting so it has to be interesting to you as a researcher as the investigator it shouldn't be that halfway through you lose interest you have to be intrigued by what you're trying to find out and of course it should be interesting to the others also though to those who are going to be reading your manuscript to the journals who are going to be accepting your manuscript this has to be interesting okay novel so you have to either confirm refute or extend previous findings it can be something totally innovative where there is nothing available at all regarding this particular sub subject but then that is something like a double edged sword okay if it's something so novel then maybe nobody really wanted to know about it maybe there is nothing worth knowing about it that should not be the reason why it is novel okay so just make sure that you are not selecting something which is so novel that someone has never done it before because it is of no use to anyone okay that is the flip side of selecting something extremely innovative that it might be useless but it has to provide new information so here i'd like to tell you that sometimes there is something which is known as a me too study that means that someone has done it before it's been there is a lot of information regarding that but in our particular setting there may not be enough data there may be dearth or paucity of information from our setting okay so something like a quality of life study for example now there are n number of quality of life studies regarding various disorders but in our setting we don't know what the quality of life is what is the impact of quality of life on our population so then it would still be novel it would still be important so whenever you are writing a research question you have to answer two main questions as to whether it is novel or rather why it is novel and the second thing is if it is important and why it is important so there has to be a very very strong rationale for selecting that particular research question okay next thing is ethical now obviously it has to be ethical i'm not going to go into great details about that because you have to pass the ethics committee test as well you have to get approval by the ethics committee it has to be relevant that means it has to advance scientific knowledge and improve practice and improve. and most importantly it should not get outdated by the time you finish the research so don't take so long to perform your research and publish it or send it across to wherever you want to send it so that by the time you send it it is outdated it should not become stale okay for example covid 19 related research so this is so dynamic that things are changing okay we are already done with two waves and the third wave is always already coming to an end so don't select don't wait for everything to get over if you are trying to select a covid 19 related topic because by then it might be everything is over and then no one is interested in your covid 19 research an example of that would be so what are the uh, sort of barriers or what are the hurdles that healthcare providers face while using ppe kits okay personal protection equipment so if you are trying to think of some topic related to that then obviously you have to do it quickly and you have to finish it and you have to disseminate it before people lose interest in that because these are dated topics okay so then the research question sets out what the investigator wants to know okay what do you want to know not what you might do because that is not the research question that is the study design what the results might ultimately contribute to that particular field so that is not part of the research question you just have to mention what you want to know in this okay so coming back an ideal research question to put it in a nutshell should be clear and focused it should clearly state what you 
what the writer needs to do not too broad and not too narrow that means it should not be so broad that you know you spend too much time answering it that the objectives are confused but at the same time it should not be too easy to answer because if it is so easy then no one would be interested in doing it or rather no one would be interested in reading about it when you publish it it should not be too difficult to answer also otherwise it could get aborted and you will end up not answering it it should be researchable okay you should be able to do something in it and preferably to analytical research questions rather than descriptive though of course there are limitations at your level as undergraduates so at your level you can definitely pick up descriptive research question and get started with that okay so the i told you earlier that you begin broad and you end narrow and this is the inverted triangle that i was talking about the topic the working knowledge of the topic working questions and finally the research question okay so you have to brainstorm narrow down define discuss and finalize so this is something that you have to remember so coming to the end of this presentation once again a recap it has to be answerable it has to be narrow enough to be covered sufficiently in the required number of pages now this is important for those who are intending a, an icmr proposal or project because you have very limited number of words you have limited number of pages that you need to be sending across in your proposal as well as in your final project so don't keep the research question so broad don't have so many objectives that you end up overshooting your permissible limit okay then it gets boring not only for your reviewers but for you as well okay so but at the same time you have to be broad enough that you can actually find information and fill in those number of pages okay if you have say 1000 words you shouldn't end up just writing something which is worth 200 words okay that's why it has to be the right size and at the same time it should be abstract enough to require analysis it, is, it shouldn't be ob obvious to everyone because if it is obvious then there is nothing worth researching about okay so before ending i just like to share a few research questions that uh, that are pertaining to my field that is dermatology so what is the impact of vitiligo on quality of life those of you who are interested in uh, taking up quality of life research questions you can do this in any branch any disease in dermatology leprosy vitiligo these are two disorders which have uh, social implications that is why people do or rather they are interested in finding out about the impact of these disorders on the quality of life here we would be using certain tools or certain questionnaires that are there pre validated the next thing is the clinico etiological profile so these are descriptive research questions that i am telling you about for analytical research questions obviously you need a control group so that can be discussed later on if you are interested you can just come to us in person so profile of genital lesions this was one type because this is also something which is related to a lot of social stigma so you can pick up topics normally icmr is you know interested in topics that have some social angle as well okay which may be neglected which may there may be some uh, social stigma associated to it there could be some psychological morbidity associated with it so you can pick up any disease any uh, disorder which has got this particular connotation okay so prevalence of them this was another uh, research question that we had done dermatological disorders among patients admitted to icu because there is there was no literature or rather there was nothing from our setting nothing from our state regarding this so these were you know from our setting we set out to find out the uh, data regarding this particular topic then this is that barriers to implementation of ipt this was our fogarty research uh, that uh, was done by department of uh, pediatrics and i was also involved in this then burden of mdt non responders so leprosy is something which they are interested in many of our leprosy related topics have found takers in the icmr and in journals as well then clinical profile fever with rash so these are just you know certain things tb leprosy they are they don't have any age they are ageless people are always interested in hiv tb leprosy etc okay so this is i with this i come to the end of uh, the talk i hope i have not bored you so before ending i would like to take any more questions that you would like to ask okay varun shall i end here i think hello yes ma'am sure uh, i think most of the questions yes. dr kanika ma'am has already answered in the chat yeah she's answered them right so, so shall i stop today any other questions you can just come here yourself we can take a couple of questions and then we'll ask our students to talk about their experience hello 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, I have a question regarding the uh, sample size. Uh, you have uh, shown that slide of uh, uh, quality of life. So, uh, for example, you showed that vitiligo on the quality of life of people, right? So, right. Uh, what should be the sample size? Because people are already uh, face difficulties uh, in their uh, in their social life due to this uh, due to these uh, diseases or we can say uh, deformities. So, what should be our sample size? Because they will, they will, they are unwilling to answer our questions already. So, no, actually, sample size is based on the prevalence of the particular disease. So, there is a formula for calculation of sample size. Okay, but for the sake of ICMR project, sometimes we have to end up taking convenient sampling because there is an endpoint. You have a very short period of data collection, which is only two months, which is a big limitation of ICMR uh, projects. So you can, you know, you cannot take, even though you have the sample size that you calculated, maybe 100 based on the prevalence. But it might be unreasonable to be able to enroll 100 patients in your two months of data collection. Sometimes it's just 45 days, okay? Then you have to do something which is called as convenient sampling. That means as many patients as you encounter during your particular two months period. That is one way of going about it. But to answer your question, patients who have stigma, but we have to, we have to take a written informed consent in which we will ensure them that there will be strict confidentiality. Okay, in any research, there are strict norms of confidentiality. So if we tell them, we convince them that nothing of this is going to be, your, your identity is not going to be revealed, most patients agree to be part of the study, even though there is social stigma. And we also have to convince them as to the benefits of the study, the benefits that they will get and the benefits that the population at large will get because of their participation in the study. Once you convince them of this, most patients agree wholeheartedly. That is our experience. I hope that answers your question, Aryan. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. It was very helpful. Yeah. Anyone else? Don't think so. Um, if if you're fine, then can we move ahead with the session? Thank you, Vasudha. I think so. I also learned so many things today. Oh my new God. ideas. <laughs> I just yep. hope not everybody has left the meeting because I lost count no, of no, ideas. There are there are thirty seven of them. We have got a roll call over there. You know the same way we do for these undergraduates. Yeah, the list, list can be printed out and Varun can do that. You see, this session is done primarily to generate uh, some ideas in you and to take up research because it can be very interesting if you uh, are bitten by the bug of uh, research, okay? Yeah, it's basically to sensitize you all yeah. to the idea of doing research, okay? So, so all these things regarding study design, sample size, all that we can talk about in subsequent sessions. So can I call on our senior yes. and our students to talk about their experience now? Of course. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for your experience. Thank Varun, you your I, may, I might have to leave for another call. They have been ringing me up. Okay. Okay. So I no problem, leave then. with if possible, I will be able to join, but I don't think so. Okay? No so, so uh, Asturi, Mrudula, and Avnika, I'm sorry I can't stay on, but uh, I'm sure the students will benefit from your talk. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Ma so, with that, I'd like to call on Dr. Avnika Sani. She is an intern at BBGMC and she has done a lot of research work throughout her MBBS and uh, yeah so I would like to talk to her and ask her about her experience and her journey while doing the STS program. Over to you. Hi, um, thank you for having me here. So um, I won't take up too much time. I have basically I'm basically here to tell you guys about my STS ICMR journey in short. So I'll do that. Um, my journey began back in November 2018 when I first approached a professor from OBGY looking to do an ICMR project. I was so clueless back then. I distinctly remember when she uh, told me that, why don't you come up with some ideas and get back to me? 
I tried, but I wasn't really getting anywhere. So I went back to her empty handed. And that's when she guided me in choosing my final topic, which was knowledge, awareness and prevention of cervical cancer among urban and rural women, a hospital based cross sectional study in Maharashtra, India. So when I submitted my proposal to ICMR in January 2019, I was wasn't really sure about how I was going to manage all of this, whether I really wanted to do this. But I began working on my institutional ethics approval anyway, which took quite a lot of time, by the way, and began collecting my samples in April. I used to go to the gynecology OPD at least uh, three to four times a week during morning posting hours. And in the beginning, I found it very hard. Like for me, I have always had a problem interacting comfortably with people. And this was really a test for me because I had to walk up to the women sitting in the OPD and ask them if they were willing to fill in my survey. Only after taking informed consent, of course, I would start interviewing them and asking them questions, all in their vernacular language like Marathi or Hindi, which was again not easy considering that there were a lot of medical terms involved in my questionnaire. I even had to go to a semi-urban and rural location, uh, apart from the urban hospital where I was working, and collect samples from the healthcare centers there as part of my study. I would say that this um, segment of my study, collecting data, was truly like a huge learning experience for me with respect to being extremely patient, being polite, being able to communicate well with the women that I was interviewing, etc. Once I learned that my proposal had been accepted, um, it finally gave me momentum and I began, like I was able to finish completing my responses by the end of August 2019. After this was the next big thing and that was data entry and statistical analysis. Having had a huge sample size of 615 and requiring a lot of statistical tests, I realized two main things. One is that you really need to understand your data set and two, it is not just a biostatistician's work. This is so crucial, and this is something that a lot of students don't understand. We think that all we need to do is submit the Excel sheet to the statistician, and he's going to magically turn up with all of your results on a silver platter. It is absolutely not as easy as that. The role of a biostatistician begins right from when you start designing your study protocol, right up till the end of your manuscript. Until those numbers speak to you, you will not realize the importance of statistics and research. This was, I think, one of the most important things I learned during my entire SDS journey. Stats is the backbone of research, and I just cannot emphasize on this enough. Today, when I attend like journal clubs or participate in research club activities such as these, it all makes sense. You know, the puzzle fits because I took the time out to understand the biostats and you know, all of the data analysis behind my research project. My report did get accepted in the end in February 2020, and I received my stipend as well. Um, I would say that this entire experience was totally worth it. I have learned more about research during those few months of doing the STS ICMR project than I would have otherwise during probably all of my huge years. So yeah, it was worth it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really enlightening. And for all of you who are new to Jignasa and our YouTube channel, uh, Ma'am already has a video about how to apply for the ICMR STS and she takes us through the entire website. So if you want to know more about that, you can watch that video on Jignasa's YouTube channel as well. Okay, thank you so much, Ma'am. And uh, You're welcome. Okay, now I would like to call Kasturi, Kasturi Double, to share her experience and how she went about doing her project. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, hi, I'm Kasturi, and thank you, Varun and Team Jignasa, for having me today here to share my research journey with all of you. So, I begin my research journey uh, with extreme grief and comprehensive information. And so, I'd be dividing it into two uh, headings. The first one is the advantages or learning experiences that I had in my journey. And the second one is the challenges I faced in my journey. So I'd be sharing a slide with all of you. Just a minute.
Okay, is my slide visible? Hello? No, it's not. No, no, it's not visible. Okay, just a minute. I'll check it once. Okay, is it? Uh, I think it must be now. Yeah, is it visible now? Yes, it's loading. Yes, yes, it's visible. Okay, so as I said that I'd be telling you about my journey uh, in the two main headings. First one is the advantages or the learning experiences that I've had. So to begin with, it was the research writing skill. So all of you by now must have known that it all starts with choosing a research topic for which you would either brainstorm with your pen and paper or you would approach your uh, professors or colleagues who have pursued research in the past or you could also surf on the internet and look through different YouTube videos. So ultimately, you end up establishing a statement and further you do a preliminary research and establish an outline for your research topic or entire research paper. So this would help you get a hands-on learning experience. That is, it would help you foster your critical thinking, your analytical skills, and also give you a broad idea and insight about the topic or the subject you have chosen. So that was about research writing. The second advantage that you gain is communication skills. So if you're doing a prospective observational study, just like what I did, it would uh, it would involve with you having to approach your patients in order to collect data. So while you approach your patients, you need to establish a rapport and a great effort into building up trust with them. This is how you could extract information and enter into your uh, and enter it as a data. So for that, you need to have very strong communication skills. And by doing your uh, data collection, this would definitely build it up. And further, these overachieving, overarching or stronger communication skills might also help you in your history taking or uh, while presenting your history in your clinics. So this is definitely going to help you in your clinics, in your exam, as well as in your research work. So the third point is about work ethic. And um, I feel as a medical student by now, you must have realized that it always isn't about being the smartest one, but it's also about working hard and having a very strong work ethic. I would tell you by my experience that I've been multiple times to the wards and I have been to the NICU and worked in close proximity of uh, Dr. Aarti Kinikar ma'am and also with my guide Dr. Reema Nakpal ma'am and the one thing that I can assure you that they have a great commitment and they have this organized and effective manner of working, which is extremely influential is what I feel. And I've learned a lot from them, not just their professors, but also my seniors and my juniors, one of which is Dr. Abhinika. I have learned a lot from her. She does her work with a lot of integrity and discipline. And about Manali, who was our previous research secretary, I would tell you that she has an excitement about research. She always has this spark in her heart eye whenever she's talking about something related to research, and that is very contagious. So on my research journey, I've had this opportunity to interact with these amazing people, and that has really boosted my knowledge. I definitely say that. The fourth point is about presentation skills. So I was never an eloquent speaker to begin with. Like I always had this stage fright. But when I started presenting my research work, I built up a lot of confidence within myself and also improved my public speaking skills. So if you are assuming that research will only help you achieve great writing skills or communication skills, it not 
it is not just that it would also help you build up your presentation and your public speaking skills eventually when you end up presenting your paper or poster in various seminars or conferences also these are the platforms where you get to interact with a lot of fellow researchers like you learn about their topics and you broaden the horizon of, of your knowledge so that is again one helpful thing that you gain in your journey the last but not the least contribution to your curriculum by day i'd be lying if i said that i didn't choose to do research for strengthening my cv yes i did and uh, yes, if you are planning to um, opt for uh, exams, which are um, like, which are not need PG, like for example, USMLE or PLAB. So for that, having research in under your resume has a very strong additional point. So that would definitely have a greater impact. And uh, yes, those were the good things about research, I'd say. Now coming to the part of challenges, the most toughest part I feel was data collection and the compilation. Is it involved printing, uh, then distribution of the questionnaires and reformulation, refining and constant revision of the research information that I was writing down. So it is a very tedious job. And this is the point where you where you lose your hope and you try to feel that this is a monotonous work to do. But somehow you need to, you know, you need to uh, motivate yourself and persevere till the end and get it done. So that was about data collection. The last two points are time constraint and balancing academics, which I tell you together. So um, I think that you need to be very wise when you're choosing the sample size, because more the sample size, more the amount of effort you'd have to put in your data collection. So choose it wisely, because you need to save some time to manage your academics as well. Also, you could always spare time in between your lectures or in between your practicals. And this is how you could find time to work on your research. So um, last but not least, I'd just say that time management and um, planning and uh, scheduling your day to day activities. It is very important when you're opting research by doing academics side by side. So I wish someone had told me about it at my time because I ended up procrastinating a lot while collecting the data and I was also subjected to a lot of hassle. So I am telling you this right now so that you don't make the same mistake as I did and you get it done before the deadline and end up having a great successful <laughs> research journey. So, yeah, I think I've told you about the pains and gains of research. And I think I'll end it over here and hand over the screen to Varun again. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a very nice and very concise talk that you gave. <laughs> advantages, disadvantages, everything in one slide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so okay. much. Thank so, you. Yeah, even Kasturi has a video on our YouTube channel where she talks about how we can uh, choose a research question. And again, talking in, in our we have a whole playlist on our YouTube channel about the basics of research. And out of that one video, Kasturi talks about how to choose a research question. Okay, so thank you so much. And now I'd like to ask Mridula to tell us about her journey and her experience. Yes. All right. Uh, uh, hi. Thank you for having me here. So it's already 9.30. I won't take much of your time. I'll quickly summarize my experience. Uh, I started my journey in second year, in the beginning of second year. I was just out of first year, so I didn't have much idea about the paraclinical and clinical subjects. Like I went to pathology and microbiology at first, but then uh, since I was not aware of all that can be done in those areas uh, i decided 
not to do anything in those i went to anatomy because that was one subject which i liked in first year uh, i approached uh, parans me ma'am in anatomy and um, we finally decided a topic after many revisions uh, one thing i would like to mention here is that choose a topic which is interesting to you like to um, it shouldn't be that uh, somebody else is saying ki okay this is a good topic and even if you are not interested just for the sake of it you decide to do it because what had happened with me was that at first we were going to do a different topic but um as i slowly researched a bit more about it i realized that okay this is something i'm not interested in it that much then we decided to switch to a different topic because the main thing is you are the so you are the principal investigator of that project and if you are only not interested then what's the point of continuing it further so that's one thing uh then secondly as um kenikar ma'am and vasudha ma'am have already mentioned that uh, methods of the study are the most important of your paper you will need to decide pre hand uh, which uh, subjects you would be including uh, what will be your sample size and whether you will be able to carry this through to the end or not so in my case what we did was we conducted a small pilot study before hand on a um, small set of patients like my study involved taking measurements on bones so i um, did a sort of a pile study beforehand just to check ki okay whether this method is um, feasible applicable whether something um, a promising result can be achieved out of this so if it is possible in your case then you should definitely do a testing on a smaller uh, number of patients or whatever your uh, study uh, variable is um yeah and um one more thing i would like to mention is that when i applied for the ethics approval for my project uh, it got rejected by the committee the first time so i would just like to mention that uh, you will come across many challenges and if you are interested and determined enough uh, you will find a way to overcome it like when i first found out that my proposal was rejected by the ethics committee um i i mean like uh, obviously it hurt that okay um what is like what did i do wrong so then i went back and um, analyzed okay these are my mistakes and then present to the committee again it got approved the second time so yeah i mean you will face a lot of difficulties while doing your project you just have to keep a calm mind and um analyze things differently talk to your guide your guide is the main um, source of motivation guidance she will he or she will help you throughout the project uh i think i will this is all i have to say about my uh, research journey so yeah thank, thank you so much that was very insightful and thank you for sharing your journey the thing about the pilot study was also very something new to me as well and i hope all of you have learned something today so yes with that we have come to the end of today's session great so thank you everyone for attending and this was the whole event the icmr stage experience and we hope that all of our speakers dr arthi kinikar ma'am dr vasudha ma'am and avnika kasturi with all of them have you know given you some insight into research and this will make your ICMR STS proposal writing as well as the whole conducting the whole research study and report writing it will make all of that easier so thank you everyone and